everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We are back with Ian Baker and we're in part three talking about Tibetan yoga principles and practices. And in the first segment, we talked about embodiment and the second in element practice. And now we're going to talk about song along practices. And so I wanted to find out a little bit about the origins of them, the intent of them, and when we may use these practices in our lives in a practical way. Mm -hmm. Great. So Tsalong, it's, you know, it's an exotic, it's a Tibetan word, uh, but it literally means something very, something that we can all relate to. So Tsa literally means channel or pathway. It's a direct translation of the, the Sanskrit word Nadi. Mm. So we know many people who are, you know, have experience with, with Hatha yoga, for example, know about chakras and they know, you know which are these energy um, plexuses along the central axis of our bodies but they are also places where uh, nadis these pathways of of, um, of of subtle energy in the body come are, are most vividly experienced and so tsa is the nadis and lung is prana so it's as simple as that prana being the sort of vital energy and uh, the three actually tsa lung is really only part of a larger word which all these practices relate to it's called salung tigle so that would be in sanskrit's nadi prana bindu and bindu is again this kind of um, vital essences in the body that are what travel they're also conscious and they travel along these these uh, energetic pathways uh, called nadi and they concentrate at the the wheels or the chakras along the central axis of the body. So the Tsalung practices uh, represent in Tantric or Tibetan Buddhism, a, a, you could say the so-called uh, inner Tantras, meaning they are no longer involved with kind of visualization, conceptual ideas of, let's say, reimagining oneself as a, as, a, as a deity, for example, an embodiment of wisdom and compassion in anthropomorphic form. They are working with kind of somatic states that we can actually access by tapping into that energetic substrate of our own psychophysical being. So, for example, so because these nadis are not referring to in the in the in the context of the kind of practices that we're talking about, they're not referring to our you know our veins and arteries. They're 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 really referring to energetic pathways. And those are things that we experience through the dynamic breathing practices that are really at the core of the Salong practice. So Salong works very much with conscious breathing, basically what we know of as in the Hatha yoga tradition is pranayama, and in particular with extended held breaths, uh, whether the breath is held out or, or held in, these are ways of activating energy circuits um, uh, at this sort of subtle core of the body. I'm almost a metaphysical anatomy. And yet it's not really metaphysical because it's experiential. But in other words, if you dissect the body, you're not going to find the same, all these patterns of and flows of energy, but they're nonetheless things we experience. We experience those, those rush of energy. Um, we can't even, you know, in a, you know, we talk about it as butterflies sometimes, but, you know, that's not something that, uh, you know, a doctor is going to necessarily be able to identify what exactly is happening. Is it increased blood circulation? Is it, you know, associated with heightened um, states of excitement? I mean, all these things are, represent subtle energy and that we can all experience in states of heightened um, experience. So Tsalung practices are trying to harness that subtle energy in the body in order to bring about a heightened state, ultimately, of what we can almost call self-transcendent awareness. Mm. Because we're talking, when we're talking about this energy substratum, we're, we're going beyond our thoughts, we're going beyond our emotions, we're going beyond our kind of conventional, just even sensations. When we touch something, for example, we're going into what would be called in you know, a nurse on the proprioceptive awareness. So the proprioceptive awareness, meaning we tune in to through meditation and these kinds of yogic practices, you know, suddenly we we're feeling that pulsation of the heart, we're feeling the heartbeat, and we're feeling it not just 
in the heart, we can begin to work with that energy and we feel it you know, coursing throughout our whole body. And we can actually amplify it through, let's say, a particular held breath in combination with a uh, with a with a, a bandha, we would refer to it in hatha yoga, sort of a a, um, a, a subtle muscular contraction at uh, at the lower chakras, for example, and that can bring about, you know, and then pulling in on the the diaphragm in a udhyana bandha, for example, this can create a kind of rush of energy um, in the body that if we tap into. Uh, in its in their most dramatic form, they can bring about what's what we understand to be the fight or flight um, response, which is suddenly this this almost a panic state. You know, when the when the breath is held out up to a degree where where's the next breath going to come from? But if we stay just sort of mindful and completely aware in that moment when the next breath comes in, this can actually lead to a to a very uh, to a, a rush of energy that is in a certain sense, you know, where there's no, there's no thought involved, there's no emotion, it's just this blissful state of flowing energy. And so this is what the Salong practices are about. They're meant to sort of be a shortcut that we can combine with, let's say, conventional meditation on which is passively observing the breath. Here, we're actually consciously altering the breathing pattern in order to bring about altered states of awareness ultimately rather than just a more quiescent approach where we just tune into the breath and we can actually come into that same transpersonal state um passively but we're talking here about a very dynamic practice so in a way more it's quite akin to what we know in the Taoist or Chinese tradition as, as qigong you know literally working with qi which is prana which is Lung. Um, so again, this is a, a particular Tibetan form, you could say, of Qigong or Pranayama uh, that works with a combination of these, uh, works with the subtle energy flows uh, within the body uh, through highly, uh, through directed breathing. So let's say I do Pranayama, do the Bandhas or whatever, you know, there are different forms of, of this and I experience a transcendent state, is it to just, what is the, why? Why, why do this? Just so I know that a tra- it's yeah. like, you know, in, yeah. in meditation you work really hard to finally like get to the transcendent state. You're like, oh, is this what I've been trying to aim for the whole time? So I can see right. how yeah. so long practices would be like, oh, is this what I, <laughs> I, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be feeling when I'm sitting on the cushion? I mean, wh- why do them? Is there a healing benefit? Is it to just, know that that is within you like what's the purpose yes well in the tibetan tradition they always talk it has sort of this dual aspect one of which is self-healing so on a on one level the self-healing aspect is about bringing balance with the of these internal elements uh, so that our psychology and our physiology are more aligned and operating optimally and this is obviously something that has you know particular uh, yeah. efficacy when we're feeling out of balance. You know, we can do these practices uh, just really for, as a kind of uh, healing practice. And, um, but they also talk, at, all of the, the, the texts also talk about that sort of a relative benefit, but that also has this spiritual benefit in this certain sense that, you know, if we try to sort of look at what it really, it's about accessing that transpersonal or self-transcendent uh, aspect of our being. When we, you know, we think of Abraham Maslow, for example, the hierarchy of needs, where you know we, we start out with our va- basic survivalist uh, needs for you know food and water, sex, with all everything else. But he, you know, originally had his the peak experience as sort of the highest level once everything else is taken care of. But then he added at the end of his life, as we know, sort of well, he felt actually that even that wasn't complete. It was self transcendence which was the ultimate um, um, yeah, need, if you will, or the ultimate capacity that we have as human beings, and that that's where our real fulfillment comes. This is when we actually can transcend all of the kind of um, 
the thoughts, emotions, and the conventional ways in which we identify with who and what we are. So all of these practices of tantric Buddhism in the Tibetan tradition are really about just bringing about an altered state of existence where we are no longer identified with our thoughts or emotions or appearance or, you know, we are living in a state which is, and because that, that energy that's released through that as when it's identified and seen, it's, it's self-transcendent. And in being self-transcendent, there's natural compassion, there's wisdom in the sense that there's insight into this level of reality, um, which in which there's no, you know, and the Zen tradition refers to it, you know, where there's no separation between self and other. We are part of a totality. We're part of a singularity that is numinous and, and, and blissful. And that's, you know, we think, you know, you're going, talking back again in the Shaiva tradition, this whole idea of, of sat chit ananda, you know, this, this, the, the, this beingness, the, the, the bliss and, you know, of existence. And that this is what, in a way, is accessed through these dynamic practices. Okay, so I, I get that, like, I can see how this is a goal symbol, like, oh, okay, that's where I want to get to, but it's often very hard to stabilize in, in that mm-hmm. state. So it's like, you know, I can do the so long practices that I've been taught and feel the energy and the coursing and feel like, wow, this is amazing. And like five minutes later, you know, I see something on the news and like <laughs> all that just kind of <laughs> goes out the window. I mean, is it, so I guess, so it's to point me to what's possible. Is it an independent practice that people do ongoing that can get them to to people literally stabilize in this state of transcendency by just doing this practice alone or is it combined like you said with you know an element practice your meditation is it just another tool in your toolbox or is it just a practice in and of itself that will allow you to reach a transcendent state on a permanent basis well, it should, I mean, ideally, uh, and again, it's important to, to say that within the, you could say the hierarchy of practices within Tibetan yoga, that Salong can be a very effective way. It's, it's described in by the tradition as Gekseo, meaning it removes obstacles and obscurations to our natural state. So yoga, as it's translated into Tibetan, is Naljor. It means literally our natural state. It just means our a natural state of integration and so uh the talum practices using the breath uh, and the body dynamically uh can bring us into a recognition of that state and as you say we, we it's it's not necessarily stable because we can often be sort of caught off guard again but the more that this becomes integrated into and it's not about the practice necessarily having to be perpetuated all the time, because ultimately the idea is to let go of any kind of external practice. I mean, even as the Buddha said, all of these techniques, techniques of meditation, he used the metaphor of a raft, you know, to get you across to the far shore. And once you've, you know, once you get to the other shore, this nirvana, you know, it's not like you want to carry your raft on the back. You just let it go. So when it's no longer serving, when it's no longer necessary, because the idea of the Tsalong, in the end, you're just resting in this natural state that has in a way has been, um, that the practice has served as a, as a portal into. And when that state becomes uh, stabilized, and that doesn't necessarily depend upon doing these dynamic practices, it can come just through a, a more, you know, um, just a recognition of that that awareness that underlies our normal cognition Mm -hmm. and ultimately when we are stable in that state then you know watching whatever kind of crazy thing we might see on the news or might happen on the the street corner is no longer going to phase us in fact we can actually use those kinds of experiences and this is what you know the tantra is so powerful at because it says you know wherever you whatever you fear whatever you desire, you know, just move in towards it. Don't move away from these things. Mm-hmm. Actually, just recognize that there is within that state. Let's just say, if it was anger, that there's a kind of heightened awareness and a and an energy there. That that's what you start to identify with. You sort of take away the narrative of the of the emotion, 
And when you've taken away the story that goes along with that state, then anger becomes this sort of, you know, brilliant, you know, state of kind of just, you know, you're never tired when you're angry, right. so for, for example. So it just becomes an ener it becomes a release of energy when you sort of strip it away from a narrative, it's no longer objectified, it's no longer directed towards a person or anything or yourself. It just becomes a way of working with energy. So it's how long as a way of working with that energy. And when that energy is flowing, then it's no longer something that is, is, is in any way uh, obstructive. Um, and um, yeah, I think I, I think, that, I get that. Yeah. I think so. Like if I were to merge this with the first segment sure. or second segment that we had on the element practice, here's where I'm getting from this is that these are all tools. Until you reach that stabilized state, these are all tools that you can yeah. use. And so maybe if I'm like, oh, my stomach hurts, it's like, oh, yeah, use the elemental practice. That's more kind of gross body level thing. Mm -hmm. If I'm I'm angry, you know, oh, focus on your liver and like releasing your liver and doing the set of exercises that help release. Yeah liver from your body if I'm just like I'm generally an angry person and I need to work on this and maybe I do this so long practice I'm just doing every day trying to change and convert that energy these are all practices use you can use either to convert that anger energy kind of depends you pick doesn't matter <laughs> you use whichever one you need at the time Maybe use both of them in combination, but it's not as if there's a progression or don't worry about it is what I'm hearing. It's like just no, use I, yeah. use. No, very much. I mean the Buddha in the in the Tibetan tradition they talk about the Buddha having determined that there were eighty four thousand methods by which you could enter the path of Dharma cool. and enlightenment. So in a certain sense it just sort of means there's it's it's infinite. And these are a set of tools and practices that have been, you know, tried and tested over thousands of years. And of course, within their lineages within the tradition that emphasize moving progressively from one to the other. But, you know, with a, a skilled teacher, the, the, the method sort of becomes different in a sense you work with the practice that is particularly relevant uh, for you where you are at this time. So that would be, you know, if one is fortunate enough to have a, a teacher uh, who one has a personal relationship with and not just sort of a theoretical, you know, I think, you know, the, the, there, there's so much uh, abuse and so much disempowerment that happens when, when uh, the guru principle becomes guru devotion. This is, you know, devotion means to put yourself below something and then there's no you know, this is not empowering. This is actually just the opposite. And we see all the kinds of abuse and problems that arise from that. But when if there's actually a mentor, um, you know, whoever that is, it's who can actually reflect back to us, you know, where we might need to, to do particular work and can guide us, then, then this, is, uh, this is very helpful. And that's really the inner principle of what the guru yoga was in the you know, mm. in tantra traditions because you know it's easy when you're sort of stimulating so much energies to sort of kind of mm, suddenly conceptualize it in a particular way and maybe get off track so the idea is that a teacher would help you to keep on track in case you kind of got a little bit kind of inflated <laughs> uh, through these practices that's the idea yeah got but it the problem, as we've seen sometimes the teachers get inflated because of the devotion that's given to them so this is the that's the other side of the coin i've got it i've seen it i've experienced yeah. it yeah. It's, it's we've been, we've been <laughs> to ian, um, ian baker about his book tibetan yoga um thank you so much really interesting pleasure